Welcome to Kingdom Life University, a division of Action Evangelism, preparing you to serve the Lord of the Harvest. Here is your teacher, Evangelist Jerry Brandt. Well, going back into uh, our theme for Romans, which is righteousness. Remember, that's what we're talking about, is righteousness. And that means right standing, right standing with God and with men. Uh, Remember the outline of Romans. It's going to be, uh, uh, I call them the five S's here, all right? Sin, uh, as talked about, we talked about in chapters 1, 2, and 3. First of all, Gentiles under sin, then the Jews under sin, and then the whole world under sin in chapter 3. And then salvation, which is righteousness imputed. And uh, that goes into the uh, doctrine of justification, and we put it in a real common term, just as if I had never sinned. In other words, we can be declared righteous in God's presence as though we had never sinned. Oh, God's grace is so powerful. So it's justification explained in chapter 3, and then justification expressed, which we looked at yesterday in the story of Abraham. He was justified by faith. He totally believed God. When God spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. And he said, God, how can I be a father when I don't even have a child? I don't even have a son. And God said, look up at the stars. As the number of the stars are in heaven, so shall your seed be. And it says, and Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. Even though he was dead, his body was physically dead from reproduction process. He could no longer in the natural reproduce. And his wife was 90 years old, for heaven's sakes. Sarah, yet God brought the promise and Isaac was born. So God uh, expressed that justification through the example of of Abraham. And today we're going to get into justification experience. You're going to love this today. And then uh, in chapter 6 through 8, we have sanctification. You see, salvation is righteousness imputed, put to our account. But sanctification is righteousness imparted, where we are given his resurrection power to reign in life now, to live victoriously. Whoa. And it's based on our new position in Christ. And we're going to find in Romans 6 that the words know and reckon and yield are really important. And then our new problem in chapter 7. Now Paul gets in the middle of the book and he just deals with a real issue. It's called the flesh. Boy, how we deal with that every day, all right? And we're going to find out how to overcome that flesh in chapter 7. Powerful, powerful section. And then our new power in the Spirit. We are more than conquerors <laughs> through Christ who's loved us and gave himself for us. And then we get into the third S, which is so- or the fourth S, which is sovereignty in chapters 9, 10, and 11. And, and this is righteousness rejected by the nation Israel. And, and it deals with the, also the doctrine of election, where Israel uh, was elected in the past, but where they had a present rejection and then a future redemption. God's going to uh, deal with Israel. God's not through with this great nation yet. And then the fifth S is service, and that's righteousness practiced. In our consecration to God, chapter 12, and our submission to authority in chapter 13, and in our consideration of the weak as we practice righteousness, true righteousness, in helping the needy. And then Paul's last uh, two chapters, chapters 15 and 16, they're really for faithfulness in the ministry, Paul's future in the ministry, Paul's friends in the ministry, and then a final benediction. And so we really got in this book so far these last few days, and uh, we've looked in, like I say, the first three chapters of Romans have really uh, been about sin. And we saw the downward spiral of of humanity from the beginning of creation. Man is not evolved, he's devolved. Even though our technology has increased, we think we're so wise today. But you know what? If we forget God and we leave God out of the equation, we are fools. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God, Psalms 14.1. And largely, that's what America and many nations of the world have done today, is said, there's no God. Why should we live as though God really exists and makes a difference in our life? And so God gave them up, it says, to uncleanness and idolatry, and he gave them over to vile affections, and he gave them over to a disapproved or a reprobate mind, and they did those things not convenient with the flesh, men with men and women with women. And, and I'll tell you what, uh, as a result, they were under the judgment of God. We looked at that judgment in chapter 2 of Romans, and uh, a judgment is not according to, uh, to man's opinion, but according to God's truth. And gu- judgment is not according to man's status, but according to man's deeds. And judgment is 
is uh, not according to man's religion, but according to the gospel of Christ. And then we went to chapter 3, got the bad news and the good news. And the good news, we started really getting into the doctrines of the Scripture, justification, redemption, propitiation. Wow, big words. (laughs) Redemption means to be delivered from sin and its penalties. We've been redeemed, purchased off the slave market of sin, and by, by a price that was paid, which is the blood of Jesus. And then propitiation is the God side of the cross in which God's holy law was satisfied. God's holiness, God's righteousness was satisfied in a completed sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. And forever sin's penalty was paid in full legally, legally in the court of heaven. And then Jesus died according to the scripture. He rose again so he could go and apply that blood as our great advocate, our lawyer, our attorney with the Father. We have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous. And then we looked in chapter 4 about uh, yesterday about resurre- about justification. Justification's by faith, not works. And justification's by grace, not the law. And justification is by resurrection power, not human effort. And uh, we studied that great doctrine of, of justification yesterday. And we're going to continue that today because really what Paul does in chapter 5 is he picks up and looks at two things. Number one, the blessings of justification. Now that we've been declared holy and righteous... And, and unbl- unblameless in his presence, and we've been adopted and accepted in the beloved, now that we've experienced that justification, what is the blessing that comes to us? What good is this going to do us? What difference is this going to make in our life? Here it is. Come on. Let's read it. All right. In chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, number one, we have peace with God. Whoa. Hello, peace with God, because we're justified. There's no one chapter in the New Testament more detailed about the important thing of salvation than this chapter. It's a clear understanding of Paul's argument so we can have the full meaning of our salvation today. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna rejoice with me in this teaching. You're going to start blessing the Lord. <laughs> you may shout a little bit and even dance around the room. Who knows? But I'll tell you what, because you're going to understand the blessings you have. You see, justification is God's declaration that I am righteous in Christ. It is righteousness imputed or put to my account. I keep repeating, but I'm trying to get you to get this. This is so powerful. Justification is righteousness imputed, given to my or put to my account. It's as though God deposits into my bank account everything I need, the, all the resources I need to be in right standing with him through Jesus. And then sanctification is righteousness imparted. It's worked out in and through my life by the Holy Spirit. Justification is my standing before God. Sanctification is my state here on earth before men. Justification never changes. It's established forever in the finished work of Christ. But sanctification changes daily as we become more and more like him. So what what, what are the blessings of this justification? Number one, we have peace with God. You see, the Bible says there was a time that we were enemies. It's in verse 10 here of chapter 5. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. We were enemies of God. Come on, let's put it down. We Before we know G, knew Jesus, we were enemies of the cross. We were alienated from God's goodness and righteousness and holiness. We didn't know anything about it. We're on the outside looking in. But now we have peace with God. That means the sin question is forever settled in the blood of Christ. My sins are buried in the depths of the sea, and God remembers them no more. Buried in the depths of the sea. If you believe God's perfect, then you know that God perfectly forgets your sin. No more to your account. He no longer imputes sin to your account, but he imputes Christ's righteousness to your life. Come on. Is this blessed or what? Number one, we have peace with God. Number two, let's read on. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace. Oh, my how deep and wide and how wide do you want to go with God? 
How big do you want to get with God? How much of God do you want to experience? Be it unto you according to your faith, Jesus said. Faith can move mountains. Faith is the central thing upon which God operates. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, for you must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Everything is done by faith. Paul said, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And what is faith? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith is understanding what God says and believing it. Simple. Except you become as a child, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not how good you are, not how smart you are, not how self-righteous you are, not how many good deeds you do, not how many church positions you hold. You may be a pastor of one of the largest churches in America. In fact, the revival in which I got saved back in the German Congregational Church in Fort Morgan, the pastor of our church got saved in the same revival. Some pastors need to get saved. You can you can put a form of godliness but deny the power of it. You can look good on the outside. Jesus called him white and sepulchre, but he said, inside you're full of dead men's bones. Put it down. But we access everything of God's grace by faith. Trust and believe, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey, says the old hymn. I love it. So you have access to God. Then, look at this. Not only so, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that our tribulations work patience, and patience works experience, and experience produces hope. Wow. How does, how does experience produce hope? Because you see God show up in the middle of the trial. All at once, something starts hitting you. It's Satan or the flesh or something from the past or people attack you or something happens. Uh, maybe an accident in your life, you know, and you say, wow, this is terrible. It's a tribulation. Why am I going through this? And then all at once, the grace of God shows up. And, you, and, and now, after you're through this trial, you think back. Like Paul, I talked about Paul in the book of Acts. He had been through four shipwrecks. So the final shipwreck on his way to Rome was really, (laughs) he said, I've been through this three times already. He had hope. Where everybody else was throwing everything overboard and saying, we're all going to perish. Paul said, no, we're not. He'd already been through three shipwrecks. You know, when you've been through trials, you have a strength about you that nobody can deny. It's not what happens in your life that's important. It's how you treat it. It's how you will let it affect your faith. If you'll bring God right into the middle of the equation when you go through a trial, if you'll bring God in that situation and say, God, I'm helpless and hopeless without you. Help me, Lord. Help me. God takes over. When I was five years old, I had spinal meningitis. The parents, my parents gave me up for dead and so did my grandparents. The doctor said I'll never live through the night. No medications back in those days. They were trying to drain my brain of the fluid and my, my spinal column of the fluid. And my, my temperature was so high, they said if he does live, he'd be, be probably permanently damaged. <laughs> hey, I've got an alibi. Come on. But you know what? They believe God. They prayed through that night. My, my parents, my mom and dad and my grandma and grandpa prayed through that night. And the next morning I cried for the first time in two weeks. God healed me. Supernaturally healed me. It's in the records of the Brush Hospital, Brush, Colorado, Brush General Hospital. You can go back and look at the records. It would have been in the year 1947. You can look up the records of Jerry Brandt's sickness and you will find healed of God. There was no human explanation for what happened. Yeah, God shows up. You know what? I've thought many times about my life and the things that God's brought me through. And I know my future is safe. You know why? Because I know God 
protects me. Just like that time I was flying my flying the first airplane I bought out of Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm flying my family at 8,000 feet over the same city I was born in. I was flying back to Longmont, Colorado, which is right along the east slope of Colorado, of the Rockies. And I'm right over Brush, Colorado. My engine quits on my airplane. <laughs> but I'm right over the airport. God got me down. In fact, I, I circled the airport, landed. Everything was safe. Dropped the gear on final approach. And I'm here today. I have a confidence in my life that the future is in God's hands. Why? My hope is in my experience of my tribulation. And hope of, maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which he has given to us. We have daily confidence in God's love. We have the knowledge of his love because we know he loves us. And if he loves us, he is going to take care of us. If an earthly father knows how to give good gifts to his children, how much more will the heavenly father God already has put a deposit in our life. He put a deposit to our account, his own son's life. Shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Come on. And so we have a future hope. It's his love for us. It's his love for us. When we were without strength in due time, Christ died for us. Look at this. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But verse 8, oh, I love this. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Come on. He died for us while we were sinners. Before we even knew him, he showed his love. How much more will he now embrace us as his adopted accepted, beloved sons and daughters of God. I believe he's going to accept us. I believe he's going to take care of us. You say, Jerry, there's a lot of coming crisis on the earth. You know what? I'm at peace. I've never been at peace like I have this year. I have a deeper peace with God than I believe in all the 66 years of my life former to this year. (laughs) I have a deeper peace. You know why? Because my experience tells me Give us this day our daily bread. Sufficient is the evil for the day thereof. Consider the lilies of the field, he said. Jesus said it. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Have you ever seen him under a microscope? Consider the birds of the field. Huh. They don't work for their living, do they? They just fly around and eat a few bugs. <laughs> for all those happy motorcyclists. <laughs> I'll tell you what, God's going to take care of us. He loves us. And so first of all is the blessings of justification in this chapter. Secondly is the basis of our justification. Now we're going to get into the basis of it. Now this is a little bit of a complex section here, so we're going to read it, uh, read it, and I, I believe it'll come to you as I explain it. All right? There are several words that God repeats several times here. All right? First of all is the word one. Let's read that, starting in verse 12, all right? Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Who's that one man, you know? Tell me. It's Adam. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no such law. So uh, let's stop there for a moment. You see, there was no law given by Moses when Adam was, was sinned, So between Adam and Moses, there was still sin, and sin resulted in death. If you read Genesis 2 and 3 and and on, the rest of the Bible, and all the days of Adam were so-and-so, and and he died, and all the days of Seth were so-and-so, and and he died, and all the days, you know, it just goes on and on in chapter 5 of Genesis and talks about all those people that died. See, uh, sin had resulted in death before the law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him who was to come. Okay, now now we see something. We're going to call him the second Adam, and that is Jesus Christ. Because, hold on to your seats, you're going to like this. The second Adam restored everything that the first Adam lost. Mmm. Mmm. Let's go there. 
But as the offense of one, so, uh, so also the, the, the obedience of one is a free gift, all right? For through the offense of one, many were dead. Much more the grace of God and the gift of grace came by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, uh, that sense, so is the gift, for the judgment was by the one unto condemnation, but the free gift is many offenses unto justification. Like I said, this Paul kind of uses some reason here, and you got to kind of go over it a few times to get it, but it really is simple. He's talking about Adam, he ta- he's about talking about the first Adam and the second Adam. For one man's offense, death reigned by one, that is Adam. Much more they w- that which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Did you get that? Reign in life. Not reign in some future kingdom, yes, that too. But he's talking about reigning now. That's why my wife and I love Joseph Prince. If you've not heard Joseph Prince on television and you get direct TV or any of the channels that have him, watch him. He's on CTN. He's on, you know, Daystar, some of the other channels. Watch this young man all the way from Singapore, a church of 20,000 people. A man in his 30s, young, good-looking guy, gets up and preaches. and It's fun to love. He's funny. I mean, he's fun to watch. And I, I tell you what, he talks every time he preaches, he preaches about Jesus and the grace of God. He's a, he says, you've got to preach radical grace for people to experience radical grace. <laughs> but he wrote a book called Reigning in Life. Reigning in Life. Reigning in life. In fact, the second word, key word in this chapter is not just one, but it's the word reign. It's in verses 14 and 17. Reigning in life now. Mm. You can have victory today. That's really what it's all about. You can know God's grace. And so the key thought here is that this, that God looks upon the human race and he sees but two men, Adam and Christ. Every human being on earth is identified with one of these two men. The first Adam, which means you are lost, or in Christ, which means you are saved. There's no middle ground. There's nobody that's half Adam and half Christ. No, no, no. You're half in Christ. You are either in Christ or you're in Adam's sin, which is death. In fact, we read in verse 14 where Adam was a type of Christ, right? A figure of the Christ, the first Adam. And 1 Corinthians 15, 45 talks about that latter Adam, Christ as the second Adam. Now, let's contrast these two for just a moment, right? If you've got a pencil and paper, you may want to write this down. It's good. The first Adam made of the earth, 1 Corinthians 15, 47. The last Adam, Christ, was Lord from heaven. The first Adam is king of the old creation, Mm, had dominion over the earth. The last Adam, Christ, is Lord of the new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17. The first Adam was tested in a perfect garden and failed. The last Adam was tested in the wilderness and succeeded. The first Adam brought sin, death, and condemnation. The last Adam brought righteousness, life, and justification. The first Adam, death reigned. The last Adam, believers reign. (laughs) And grace reigns. Verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. What makes you victorious? Grace. Say it with me. Grace unmerited favor. God's grace upon me makes me victorious. God's grace upon me and favor upon me causes me to reign in life now. And that grace is released by faith. Remember earlier we said it? That grace is released by faith. So here we have the Bible. Now we are in Adam through the physical birth. Every man, woman, and child on the earth is born into Adam and into Adam's death, and into Adam's sin. But we're born in Christ through the second birth. No wonder Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born again. 
Wow, let's just kind of review. <laughs> Time is really going quickly. Uh, verses 15 and 16 of this chapter, the offenses versus the free gift, all right? Of, as as uh, But now, or not, as the offense, so also as the free gift. So there's a contrast here, the offense and the free gift. Adam's offense brought condemnation and death. Well, the free gift of God brings justification in life. And then there's death versus life in chapter ver- or chapter 5, verse 17. For by one man's offense, death reigned, death reigned by one. Much more, they, they that which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So we have it. And then condemnation and justification, contrasts. Adam's sin plunged the human race into condemnation. Christ's death brings right standing with God. Adam hid from God. Christ gave us free access to the presence of the Father in heaven. How about that? In verse 19, disobedience versus obedience. Adam disobeyed God and made us all sinners. Christ obeyed the Father and brought us righteousness. And then law versus grace. In verse 20, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound. For where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. Did you get that? Where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. I love it. God's grace. And we're going to close today with a talking about God's grace. We're, we're going to close today with offering you what I've been talking about the last three or four days. You see, I'm an evangelist. You have to admit one thing. Uh, <laughs> Romans is really a lot of fun for evangelists. Why? Because it's the very theme of what we're about, and that is bringing the knowledge of Jesus Christ to men and then bringing men to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We are reconcilers with God. That's what we are. He's given us a ministry of reconciliation, bringing people into right relationship. That's what it's all about, like we did at Patsy's house a few days ago. I love winning people to Jesus. Nothing thrills me more than bringing people into the kingdom of God. That's really what it's all about. I love to bring people. You know why? Because I'm going to be spending heaven and eternity with him forever. We're going to be celebrating together in heaven. Does that make you happy? I'm going to have the knowledge that I had a part in bringing them to their eternal destiny, that they might reign with Jesus Christ. It would be my joy today, my joy, to bring you to Jesus. Remember three things. Number one, God loves you and has a plan for your life. Say it, would you? God loves me and has a plan for my life. Number two, you are lost without Jesus. Your sins have separated you from God. You are lost. And if you don't find Jesus, you will be lost for eternity. We don't want that. That's why Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open his heart, I will come in and sup with him, and he with me. You're lost. You need Jesus. But thirdly, life. He has come to give us life, his life, and give it more abundantly. If you want to really live, find Jesus. If you really want to know what works, find Jesus. Come on, that's where it's at. So I'm going to pray with you right now. This is a prayer of salvation. Would you pray it with me? Say, Jesus, man, Jesus, I know you love me. Father, thank you for loving me so much that you sent your son to die for me. It overwhelms me to to believe that someone would love me that much. For we read today, for scarcely will a, for a righteous man would one dare to die, much less for a sinner. But Father, you did it because... You loved me so much and you wanted me to be with you in heaven forever. So I invite Jesus right now in my heart. I open the door of my heart to you, Jesus, and I say, come in. Come into my life today and wash my sins away by your blood. What Cleanse me today by your blood. Take my sins away and bury them in the depths of the sea. Don't remember my sins anymore, Father. I want you to put them away from me today. 
forever, my past. Because I know the sins of Adam have haunted me my life, all my life. I receive you, Jesus, now. Come into my life. And 